Now on to our main topic today here on Mastering Dungeons featuring Rel. We are going to talk about setting expectations for your TTRPG projects. And when I was trying to figure out how to uh, replace Teos this week, and I, I reached out to you, Rel, and I said, what topic would speak to you the most? We're sort of in the middle of, of our larger topics. Now we're going to be moving on to something else soon. So I wanted to get like a one shot, something really vital to, to what, you, uh, what you wanted to talk about. So tell me why this topic for you? So I've been getting a lot of, uh, I guess, requests from folks lately uh, looking for advice. Mm -hmm. People who want to create their own systems and or want me to even like review systems that uh, that currently exist. And I, I try to ask folks what what their goal is just to start out because uh, that's that's not where I started. And, or I guess maybe my goal is just like shifted over time. It was just a, a fun project with friends and a creative outlet for me, but then it morphed into something else. And so when I ask folks, uh, what their, their goal is, usually it'll end up somewhere in the realm of, you know, I, I want to just want to make this thing. And, uh, and if I can make money from it, then, then good. I think a lot of people are in that spot because they see the success of, you know, shadow dark and, uh, other you know, games that are uh, systems that are coming out, DC 20, you know, massively successful. The, the trick is that, uh, you have to realize that you're not any of those people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we, yeah. we can fixate so much on the successes and then forget about, uh, everything that it took to get there. Mm -hmm. Uh, just for a little bit of, of clarification on my project, uh, distal is, this is my first foray into the, the tabletop role-playing space. The game itself is, uh, trying to identify a niche where I actually we kind of touched on it a little bit earlier, where um, a lot of the the systems that are kind of coming out, so MCDMs, RPG, Daggerheart, uh, DC20 are are all focused on this high fantasy, your hero, everything's awesome sort of feeling, and that that doesn't really resonate with me as a as a player. So because I, I like Lord of the Rings and I like you know the attrition of of having to you know just scrape through, you know, do difficult things in spite of the circumstances, not because it's a guaranteed victory. So that's what my game kind of centers on. At the same time, it's not, uh, it's not super gritty. Like we don't want to, you know, hack your limbs off, you know, when you're walk down the wrong alleyway, we don't want your characters to die. In fact, we want them to have a, a long, not necessarily healthy life, but a long <laughs> adventuring career, right. uh, in the same way that like, you know, Frodo from Lord of the Rings has, where at the end of that, he's totally broken, defeated. He can't even go back to his normal life, has to go, you know, live uh, with the, what is it, Valinar? Um, just yeah. the, the elves, um, their, their magical uh, forever home. And uh, so I think that I'm, I'm bouncing around a lot now, That's but okay. identifying your goal, uh, not just for for the system that you would like to create, but also why you're creating it is a really important place to start. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you, if you want to jump in on, yeah. on anything. Okay. Yeah. I, I think that goal is really important. And there, I think there are a lot of steps that go into defining and recognizing that goal. You know, as you said, people will say, well, I just wanted to make something and if I can make money, great. If you need to make money, that's a whole different goal than I just want to create something. So that's just the tip of the iceberg in setting up a goal. Uh, the audience for your game is hugely important when you're setting your goal, because you can say, I want to create a system with this feel, but unless you've identified who is going to be the audience for that sort of feel of the game, you might have a disconnect right from the start between the system that you're trying to create and the audience that would be best served from that by that system. So that creating of the goal 
it's an important first step, but it's also a very complicated first step that you really need to take the time to think about. Yeah, some some good places to start are first off, uh, be honest with yourself, figure out why. If there is a financial motivation, that's first off, TTRPGs are not a great place to make money. Um, I think that's what I've been told nonstop. I didn't believe it. I was wrong. Um, it's, <laughs> uh, and you, you also, um, if you're starting from a, from a place of just wanting to create something as a, uh, as a, you know, creative, uh, release valve or an outlet or whatever, then, uh, that, that might be a very, uh, personal, uh, expression for you. And, but like Sean was saying, your, your audience matters, uh, a good way to start creating anything is to, to actually just begin it as homebrew for your, your table. You know, what, what sorts of, uh, problems are you trying to solve? Or are you just making like a thing that you think will be fun? Because if it's not solving a, a problem, then uh, it's very difficult to attach, uh, or to get others attached to that idea because everybody has cool ideas. And, uh, a lot of, yeah, but ideas don't go anywhere. Execution is what matters. Yeah. So the more that you can identify like a pain point and say like, I really don't like this about Dungeons and Dragons, just as an example, or, you know, any TTRPG, the, the more that you can, uh, kind of, uh, express that in such a way that other people are going to be able to understand, mm -hmm. they need to be able to see the value. Yeah. Um, there's no such thing as designing a game for everyone that literally does not exist because everyone has wildly different expectations, um, uh, just, you know, interests mm -hmm. and, uh, and even when it comes down to more mechanical, uh, you know, are, are you designing a game for people who, uh, like, are you, are you considering, you know, folks that are colorblind? Like if all of your, uh, formatting and layout is really reliant on colors, well, it's a little bit, you know, uh, it might put off 10% of the population. Right. So there's, I guess there's a lot of considerations. Um, you know, I really, I really wanted this conversation to be more structured than it, than it actually is. And I'm just like, I am oh. bouncing on all over the place. Hey, the, it's, it's the mastering dungeons effect where we just go off in any direction that we feel like, but your, your point is, is good in that you, you need to really figure out who you're designing for. And the first person that you should be designing for is yourself. Uh, because you know what you like and you are aware of the direction that you want to go. So while it is important to know this is the segment of the audience that I see, you better like what you're doing for yourself because at some point you are there's only going to be one person who's judging you and that's going to be you. And while you shouldn't judge yourself too harshly, you also should not judge yourself too leniently. Once you get to that point where there needs to be a little bit of sandpaper taken to the project and some of the edges need to be smoothed out and some of that work needs to be done. Uh, so, and we're talking about this a little bit as sort of a designing for a larger group. The same thing applies if you're just creating an adventure for your home group. Uh, these, all of these principles, maybe to a bit of a lesser extent, but still are valuable and true for any sort of creative, uh, creative endeavor within the RPG field. You need to have an eye. In the short term, absolutely, what's right in front of you for sure. But a little bit down the road, you need to have that goal, that expectation, that understanding of what the final project needs to look like. So you're planning both the short term, what do I need to do today? And in the long term of where is the final, where's the finish line that I'm heading toward? Yeah. How, how can you get people to support you if you have a project that needs support so if you're creating an adventure uh like sean was mentioning if it's going to be 
something that is interesting to you but not potentially interesting to the players at your table then there's a mismatch mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh if you can clarify that up front and say like hey it would be fun uh or one thing that i would like to try is to run this campaign that's very espionage focused and you know just put the feelers out there mm -hmm. and if there's an interest then you know that there could be something that you can you know kind of work toward so figuring out um who your your audience for even if it's small scale uh is super important to help and clarify what your goals or i what your goals are but what they uh could be i guess uh one other approach is like if you if you know that you feel really strongly about either a particular niche or a certain style of play and that's what you want to design for uh the, the question then becomes how can you attract people of like mind mm -hmm. and it's it can be detrimental if you try to deviate from your niche too far to try to um broaden that audience because then that's one of our first talks was talking about just creating all these optional rules and stuff mm -hmm. it tends to water down the the hook that you could potentially have for for your game and system don't try to design for everybody don't even try to design for a, a whole bunch of people just design for yourself first like sean said and then you know, maybe even your table mm -hmm. to start uh because they will hopefully be able to give you some feedback and highlight very obvious glaring weaknesses that you just didn't consider mm -hmm. and a lot of this comes down to uh it what you're really trying to do at the end of the day if you're if you're starting something new is get better at doing that thing so that the next time you do a project it'll be even better mm -hmm. uh so starting small i didn't do it don't do it like me um please just start small write something because the act of doing mm -hmm. is what ultimately is going to help you learn uh in yeah. in doing so i mean when you're trying to think about what sort of project to create i think identifying weaknesses in, in other systems is a good place for maybe for homebrew um to start in particular and then if you have enough of those weaknesses or enough of those um, different uh, aspects of of a game you, it can become its own system but then okay what can you commit to if you're creating your own system are you creating it uh and again it goes back to goal but if you're creating it just for your own table then knowing what your players are, are going to want um figuring out what sort of information they can take on board mm. uh when i'm reviewing other people's uh games I run into a situation where you'll oftentimes have like a lot of really good ideas, but they don't feel cohesive. Mm -hmm. They're not an experience or a rule book or like a, just a bucket of, of loose papers. And what you're looking for to, when you're creating a system is figuring out the, the path of, of least resistance to mm -hmm. get to, uh, to get to understanding, get to playing and, um, and get to having fun. So, figuring out how to uh which parts of of your experience are most important mm -hmm. is uh is like a, one of the ways that you can um bring people in right from the very start uh this is tangential but when you look at um how the the dungeons and dragons uh character creation is going to work in 2024 it's a little bit different than in 2020 or in 2014 rather yeah. um and uh starting with class is is a major change uh and instead of starting with you know species uh what have you so what it does is uh signal to the people who are playing the game what the most important part of that game is for you or at least you know an important part of the game so we say that classes super important this is your identity you know what you're going to do both on and off the battlefield and and i'll know immediately if i was a new player walking to dungeons and dragons that this is a class-based game mm -hmm so just those subtle or maybe not so subtle uh, signals uh matter so thinking about organizing information um is super important too and mm -hmm. again talking to your table can help you identify some of those or you know, talking to your audience could help you identify some of those uh aspects of the game that you didn't consider from the outset yeah yeah one of the first things when i'm reading a new game that I do, or at least I hope to do, is go to that section where it's like a play 
and they're going through the game where DM Charles says, and then it, you know, and then Sally, player one, says, and I go to that and I say to myself, are they showing me what this game is? And if it's supposed to be D and D but different, are they showing me how it is different than D and D? Uh, and if it is done well, when I read that, I can say, ah, I see what this game is offering. I see how the game expects players and the game master to interact with the game. What sorts of questions are, are called out? What sorts of tactical decisions am I making? How my character, not just the choices I make, but the choices I made during character creation, how they are going to come into the game, come into the story that's created from the game. And if that's done really well, I immediately want to get in there and read this game and, and understand. If it's done poorly, I am almost immediately turned off because it's just copying and pasting from this other game where you make this choice and, and roll this die and then this happens. One of the, a game I edited once had that sort of thing. And I was like, cool, I'm gonna edit this and I'm gonna love it. The players never failed a roll. So I never learned from that game what a failure is supposed to mean. Or can you ever fail in this game? Is, do I want to play a game where the characters always succeed? Uh, all of those things spring to mind uh, when I when I tackle a new game. Uh, so what's funny is I don't have a section like that mm -hmm. in my material at all. Mm -hmm. uh, but my material specifically is designed for people who already have an understanding of Dungeons and Dragons. For sure. And because they do have that understanding, it's not important to the, the game's in alpha right now. Um, it's not important to the mechanical alpha material. Mm -hmm. And I think understanding what, uh, what conventions your audience is already going to walk into your game with mm -hmm. will both help you uh, figure out how to defy them if necessary or lean on them Mm -hmm. So that you don't need to over elaborate yeah. on, like I, I don't need you know paragraphs of of text uh, talking about how to roll initiative if it's the same as yeah. you know rolling initiative in another yeah. game. Uh, that that's for maybe for alpha for uh, a full game when I'm trying to onboard new players, it'll be different. But also to that end, when you're developing something, I it's I don't even necessarily know that it's like okay, you're going to make this game start to finish and then it's just going to be good and send, send it into the, the wild. I've never seen an instance of that. Mm -hmm. um, if it exists, please let me know. But usually there's, you, you go through phases. Um, for me, it was starting in alpha, which is mm -hmm. mostly this is an idea of what the game is. Things are going to change drastically from, from here, you know, uh, and then into beta, which should be a little bit more stable. It should say, this is what the game is going to look at. There's still work or look like this is what, um, or this is how it's going to play. Mm -hmm. These are pretty well established. Uh, there's still plenty more work left to be done, mm -hmm. but uh, you should be able to take this and run with it. And then you would end up with a final product, uh, hopefully after some closed and open beta testing uh, to help you know finalize uh, and work out the kinks or sand the edges. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then you you know, end up delivering on something. Yeah. So the question that I have, I guess, is if you wanted to create a commercial product, how do you get there? I, because it's, it's not just throwing up a game on Backerkit, on Kickstarter, and hoping for it to do well. You, you need to figure out what you can actually do, what your strengths are, mm -hmm. uh, and how much financial safety net you potentially have. So for, for me, um, my, again, I've made so many mistakes. I ended up creating a, a backer kit um, after I, I did a bunch of alpha stuff. Like there's a solid alpha 
uh, sitting there in the game. I mean, it's 130 plus pages that you can go play now for free. And then there was a quick start and, you know, character sheets and everything else. And I, most people don't start there. I, uh, most people, uh, will, will kind of, um, well, I guess I, should I, should I even say most people, or am I just speaking from my experiences? How, uh, Sean, how, when would you decide to, uh, put something up on Kickstarter and say, trust us, this is the product that you're going to get uh, at the end. For a just a strict role playing game, no, no minis, no tchotchkes, no, no anything like that. I would say you need to have a playable core game before you take the first pledge on Kickstarter. Uh, this is for someone new. This is for someone who, uh, you know, doesn't have a huge company behind them, say. Uh, but yeah, you definitely want that. But what you also want is a, an, an audience before you start. I think that that is the most important thing is you want to have YouTube, Twitch, newsletters, that sort of thing, where you know that when you send out that first, our, my Kickstarter's live, you are sending it out to people, uh, not just going on to Twitter and saying, hey, I made my game, come see it, because then you will not get backers. Right. Yeah, the, uh, the build it, they will come sort yep. of situation doesn't really no. work. Nope. Uh, yeah, we, we've definitely entered an era where you it's it's great to have a, a following on social media. Mm -hmm. um, but I, as, a, as a caveat there, mm -hmm. I, OK, so before I, I was in the games industry, I was a YouTuber uh, professionally and ended up like 85,000 ish subscribers over like mm -hmm. the course of four years and that sort of thing. This was back in 2012. Mm -hmm. uh, is when I, uh, roundabouts there. And it was back then my audience was centered very heavily on first person shooters mm -hmm. and, and not tabletop role playing games at all. Right. This is a new experience. So I still have like a, a whole bunch of subscribers, but the two things happened. First of which is that, um, there's, there's very little overlap between my existing community and then the ones that I I'm hoping uh, will play yep. my, my role playing game. Yep. And then the other thing is that uh, YouTube changed mm -hmm. the way that they uh, distribute content to, to people. You're, you're no longer able to reach all of your subscribers. It's kind of, it's, it's, it's really, I mean, it's not the wild west, but if mm -hmm. things feel random and really what it comes down to is that the, the notification bell, was created after my time so the, i mean i have a very very low amount of people who have actually clicked on that bell so my content doesn't syndicate to them because it's tabletop role-playing content and then my the rest of my channel is first person shooter stuff yeah. from from this other video game so it doesn't really match up sure so i would say that the best way to uh to build an audience is not necessarily like gain a youtube following because that's it's just a difficult trick in and of itself, sure. but it's, it's to build slowly, um, mm -hmm. is to, to create projects, put it on itch.io, mm -hmm. uh, take every single subscriber or, uh, somebody who has an interest in something that you're creating and, and hold them closely mm -hmm. because it is over time through the, uh, through the proof that you can create something through the uh, excitement of the people that surround you that you will eventually be able to create a larger project and have it be successful. Mine was, was very, it would, it would not have funded in, um, it, uh, my goal was set to on backer kit was like 20,000, which by the way, too high. Don't set it. Or was it 20,000? No, I think it was, uh, 18 maybe. Okay. Anyway, very, you, you, there's a game that you have to play. Uh, there's a skill set that you learn um, and setting a price really, really low 
mm-hmm. is will make you like like oh you know we funded in 30 seconds or whatever it's like yeah, yeah. of course you did but really like how much right. of that is actually going to come out of your your pocket um yeah. if it weren't to do well yeah i didn't go that that way i said like eighteen thousand is like the bare minimum all this money is going to go toward art uh because i i need the money to to make the book yeah. um most people don't do that and I'm not knocking on anybody i know uh <laughs> sean you've, you've seen a number of you know, kickstarters you know yeah. uh and it's that is unfortunately the game that you have to play sure yeah. don't be stu- don't be stubborn like me um <laughs> it's just set a low low amount because it will help propel your success um on that platform because people like to know uh that your project is funded and that they are going to get something sure. but don't set it the number low enough that you're not willing to pay out of pocket right. um you know for it because then you get in trouble uh, so there's there's a balance there um but it's, yeah anyway start small and build projects know that your first project is not going to do successfully uh or is, is not going to do well keep it um start building up an itch.io backlog of of many small games because then at the very least you can point to it and say like look at all this other stuff that i've done and you will have some credit to your name yeah. or at least you know, some sort of paper trail that you, you have some design chops. Mm-hmm. A lot of games that are created aren't actually tested before they're put into the, the ether, which is, it's a dang shame, mm-hmm. honestly. Yeah. When, when you're trying to, you know, pursue the, uh, the, I guess it's making money, you know, financially from, and again, teach RPG is not the, the place to do that. Uh, <laughs> or rather there's, there's plenty of other ways to make money, uh, easier and more easily. Yes. Yeah, all of these are really, really great points. The The point especially that I want to focus in on was proving that you can make something before you make something. And as you said, put it up free on itch, put it up on the DMs Guild as free just to show that you can do it. And that goes not just for doing your own projects, but that goes for freelancing as well. I will have people come to me and say, I really want to be a freelancer. What do I do? And my first question is, what have you done? And if all they can say is, well, I play every week and I blank. And and I'll say, well, do you have... You want to write adventures. Do you have an adventure you can show me? You want to design classes. Do you have a class you can show me? And if they can say, yes, go to this link, go to my DMs Guild page, go to my blog, go somewhere and show me what you've done, then I can at least say, yes, I know you can finish a project. Whether it's someone hiring freelancers or a consumer willing to put $5 down for a Kickstarter for a project, that proof of life, that proof that you can do the thing is hugely, hugely important. Doesn't have to be beautiful. Doesn't have to have a lot of art. Uh, Just show me that you know the format for a class. Show me that you know that a class in D&D needs subclasses uh, and that you've done one to go along with your class. Those are the most important things. And make sure it's done not perfectly, because as we've discussed throughout this whole episode, there is no such thing as perfect in role playing games, but that it is done to a point where it is complete. And you might need to have not an editor, not a professional editor, your buddy, your friend, a coworker, somebody who you game with, look it over and say, you realize you have 12 typos in here. They don't need to be an expert in role-playing games to know that those 12 typos need to be fixed before you give your resume to someone, before you give your initial pitch to a potential audience. Those things are hugely important. Uh, how often do you, so when, when hiring somebody to, to help do work on, on a project, mm-hmm. uh, how, how much does the technical language, um, matter, uh, in the examples that they're showing? 
So, you know, D and D formats, there's spells this way and there, you know, subclass abilities this way, um, is do, do they need to be at that point or do you feel like they can learn that? I tell my class that it is much easier to teach good writers how to do rules than it is somebody who knows rules, how to be a good writer. And that's what I'm looking for in the sample is, yeah, get the format somewhere in the right place. Uh, understand that spells generally have components, right? That sort of thing. But what I'm looking at is, can you rub a noun and a verb together and start a fire? Can you write in a way that when I read this, I understand it? Because the hardest thing to do as a writer in my experiences up to this point, both as a writer and as someone who works with writers, is to have that idea in your head that's beautiful and wonderful and creative and putting it down on the page in a way that people can understand it. And you, that translation, that transition from idea to words to thoughts on the page is the hardest thing to do well. And if you can do that, I will, I will get an editor to format. I will make. Sh I will be the developer that says, "Oh, don't forget that you need to put in a, a duration on your spell, or don't forget to that there's a component cost to this." We can we can deal with that later. You give me something well written. We can work with that. If you'd like uh, to find a place where you can start practicing right now. The, if you go to D and D Beyond, um, mm -hmm. when you create a like a magic item or you know a, a species or uh, a spell, like there, mm -hmm. you, you can go through that process and yep. and create something, um, mm -hmm. like a template and, that you fill in. Right. I, I mean, it's a, it's a little bit finicky, but on I, I've created like uh, a. I've created a species and some some homebrew weapons that I just wanted to see um, in the game for for my campaign. Yeah. But they have that function that the in D and D boundary you, you to do. So mm -hmm. if you get to the point where you're you're trying to uh, practice or you know or have you know, proof of work, that is something that you could potentially li link to a an employer uh, as yeah. well. For sure, that's a great point. That's a great point. Uh, so, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Um, What's your what's your take on the the need for art to create a commercially successful product? I am the worst person to ask this because I am so out of tune with art. Uh, I know it's hugely important. Yeah, the the business person in in here knows that yes, you have to have art. Yes, it's got to be captivating. Yes, it's got to capture the mood of your your thing. But I am so not that person who looks at art that I need help in that area. I need at any project they work on a strong art director who is going to be able to do that part of the job for me. Uh, what was your experience with that working on your project? So it is, if, if I would have gone back in time, I would have almost, I, I would have contracted out a couple of pieces for, or a couple of like really key art is, is what you'd call it uh, for my project so that it would be more interesting to others. Mm -hmm. So this is, there's this little catch 22 when it comes to creating something new where art um, can very easily attach somebody's uh, emotion or like grab somebody's emotions. And if you can do that, then they will, uh, it's easier to get them to actually look deeper into your product. Mm -hmm. If it's just words on page, um, it's very difficult for, for you to, to have somebody feel committed enough to, to read to whatever point they need to read to understand what you're doing. Um, so that's, I, like, I didn't get a uh, strong art until later on in the process. And originally I was using AI art, which is, I, I wish there, I wish it was more, um, ethically appropriate 
mm-hmm. to to do such a thing. Now, now I'm not. You know, that's mm-hmm. one of the reasons why you know Backer Kit is is so helpful in getting real human art. Right. Is that uh, it's expensive. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you can potentially run afoul of of knowing that you need something and then getting it in the. I don't even want to say the the wrong ways, but um, but the TTRPG community does not like AI art for mm-hmm. totally valid reasons. Mm-hmm. So if you're looking to create a commercial product, don't go that route, mm-hmm. which means that you have to consider um, what you can do. Mm-hmm. So uh, getting art that's just black and white, mm-hmm. more it's less expensive than than getting full color art. Uh, you can uh, find folks who are. I mean, I don't know, like artists nowadays can, they can create games because they've gotten the the hardest um, or the most, I guess, prohibitive part of the process uh, down. And you'll see a lot of artists creating little indie uh, RPGs because, because they, they can, you know, hook people. I don't know if those games are any good. Right. I mean, I don't know what their design, design chops are. And hopefully they've, that's something that they've cultivated, uh, you know, through the process of, of doing, yeah. but point being is a really important part of the process. Yeah. So uh, my experience, I, I did end up contracting out um, a, a character at one point mm-hmm. and $550, which is honestly, it's, it's a really good price for, yeah. for commercial use in a full uh, body character piece. Mm-hmm. And, um, and my mistake, I guess, was, was just being really excited about the character that I was creating I didn't create a piece that conveyed what the game was about. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, it's uh, it's a it was a character piece of just a lineage from my game, which is it's an Atlian, so uh, trident like mm-hmm. or uh, triton like. Um, and I was very excited about it. I love the art, but it doesn't actually do that much for me. And I even tested this in uh, in when I was running advertisements. So seeing what would perform better usually you'd want like a face on uh uh to like help hook people uh but for me it was just like the logo that i made um just by hand did way better than showing them that there's this like fishy person on on the art because it doesn't it doesn't tell you what the game is about so that's a pitfall that you can fall into is that art is important and it should help support the themes mm-hmm. of your game you're going to need more of it eventually probably Mm-hmm. But um, and if you can't afford it, then then don't go that direction. Uh, focus on, I guess, on uh, layout would be um, kind of another path. Like you can create really compelling layouts without uh, detailed art, mm-hmm. just by being kind of creative, mm-hmm. or being you know if you're creating like a, a small you know handful of pages indie game, you can create something that's quirky and pretty compelling. Right. Uh, you still do need to learn the skills, like how to do um, those sorts of things. And, uh, and if you, if you don't have them, then there's probably places that you can reach out to, whether that's a friend who just likes to draw or it's a, um, you know, somebody online who there, there's a bunch of people who do like character sheets mm-hmm. in, you know, just an, an art style who also have like layout um, capabilities, like ask them, yeah. you know, see, give, give you a quote for how much it would cost. But then knowing how much art you're going to need mm-hmm. is, a, is a really important part of the process too. And it's also really, really difficult to figure that out until you've <laughs> created a whole bunch of it. So uh, yeah. yeah, it's all a process that you have to work through. Yeah, it's it's such a convoluted and expensive and uh, harrowing process at points that uh, and it, it always comes back to do your best work and keep at that and opportunities will open. You will make mistakes. You will have to go back to the drawing board. You will need to revise and edit and so on. But if you are doing the work that you love, that there's an audience for, building that community that we talked about, whether it's through YouTube or a newsletter or a blog or just in chat chat rooms, uh, Discord, uh, Reddit, what have you, 
as you build that community, there will be opportunities. There will be opportunities to meet people that are artists who are looking like you to put out something. You can work out those those issues and collaborate. Same thing with graphic artists and layout and, and so on. Um, just believe in what you're doing and there will be opportunity. There may not, it's not going to be a vault opening for you and everything you ever wished for coming. But little by little by little, a connection here, an opportunity there, a partnership here will bear fruit at some point. Yeah, you, there's no getting around doing the work. No, that's yeah. that is sadly the case. Uh, anything else before we shut this puppy down? I think I think we are all good. Uh, I'll apologize to the viewers real quick, and that yes, it was, it was very rambly. I hope that you pulled something of value out of it. Uh, if you have any questions or just want to like you know, get my experiences, hit me up on Discord or, or Twitter or, or what have you. And okay. um, I'm always looking to, I, I can talk about this stuff on stuff. So. Yeah. While, while we're doing that, where can people reach out to you, find your work and so on? Uh, yeah. So if you're interested in uh, Distal, my tabletop role-playing game, you can check that out at playdisrpg.com. The campaign has closed, but you can still pre-order the game. Uh, all the way up until the point where we lock lock it down so that we uh, can get the books actually made. Um, but aside from that, on Twitter, at RealPlays, or on YouTube, at RealPlays. Uh, there you go. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Rel, for joining us uh, this week and doing a wonderful job stepping in for Teos, who hopefully will be done with his world travels by next week. Yeah, thanks for having me. No problem at all. And I want to thank all our listeners out there, and especially those who back us on Patreon. You can join our Patreon by going to patreon.com slash mastering DND. Uh, thank you to all our listeners. Thank you to our supporters. You can follow the show uh, online at mastering DD on the socials. You can follow me on the socials at Sean Merwin. So hopefully we've helped a few folks this week. Uh, so what are we going to do now? Uh, we're going to make games. I am going to definitely be doing that in about 30 seconds after I shut this down. <laughs>